ہے او سیکرمن موسٹ ہولی او سیکرمن دیوائن او فریز اینڈ آل تھینکس گیونگ وی ایوری مومنٹ Already we have come to the eighth day of our Corpus Christi, the eighth mass, before the Blessed Sacrament exposed. Today, after mass, the Blessed Sacrament will remain exposed a while longer, whilst we chant the Vespers to open the next feast, the Feast of Reparation, of Confidence and of Love, the Feast of the Sacred Heart. I always think that this Thursday and next Thursday, which is the Feast of the Eucharistic Heart of Jesus, are two days in which we should really try to make a holy hour before the Blessed Sacrament exposed. So if you count some of your Mass time today and can stay maybe after Mass for a little bit, well then you'll make your holy hour of reparation just as our Lord requested of uh, St. Uh, Margaret Mary a la Coke. Then at the end of that time of adoration in the Vespers, then there'll be the closing benediction of the Blessed Sacrament. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. St. Gertrude the Great, in her vision, sometimes daily, of the Sacred Heart of Jesus, was once shown our Lord's heart as a harp, a harp which the Holy Ghost was playing. The thought occurred to me this morning, how appropriate then, that that saint whom popular devotion in his own country in the fourth century referred to spontaneously as the harp of the Holy Ghost, introduced us this year to the feast of the Sacred Heart of Jesus. He is St. Ephraim of Syria, one of the doctors of the Eastern Church and a great, great uh, and valiant defender of our Lord's kingship, of our Lord's divinity against the heretics, the Arians of his day, a deacon out of humility and humility with his, his great strong force, as well as He counted his humility on a personal side with this wonderful sort of a, of a sense of originality. The Holy Ghost inspired him to do what needed to be done in order to keep the faith alive and to banish heresy. And as we shall see, he did it beautifully. First, a word about our commemoration, St. Marcus and Mark Celiano, like, like Primus and Felician last week, were brothers who died as martyrs in the Roman persecution. They were um, hung from a post, and then their feet were nailed to the wood of the post, and they tried to make them apostatize on that occasion, and they remarked, no, thank you. They were quite comfortable, thank you. And that really, this was extreme comfort and extreme joy to them, because they knew that they would shortly be with our Lord in heaven, and they wanted to suffer a little bit here on earth for him. They also tell the story, though, and this is interesting in the connection of family, that the you know, family has its uses. It can be sometimes positive and sometimes negative. Well, when it comes to keeping and passing on the faith, his fa their family is said to have come to visit them and to try out of a false human sense of sympathy to persuade them to apostatize. And they, had, and they wavered just a little bit because of family. But then the Holy Ghost came to them and strengthened them and they died as glorious martyrs. Today in the Divine Office we read the story of Samuel, uh, the, the prophet and the Old Testament priest, who had grown to be an old man, and um, because his family had failed him, his two boys were not worthy to succeed him, they were dishonest, just as were the, the sons of the priest of Eli, when Samuel was raised in the tabernacle of the Lord at Shiloh, the Jews, because of using that pretense or occasion, demanded a king just like any other nation. And our Lord had wanted personally to be their king. The whole idea of a human kingship really has behind it a great sorrow to the heart of God the Father, that God was, was rejected, and that a man had to be put in his stead. And in the Divine Office today, Samuel warns the people what would happen if they have a human king. You'll take your sons and your daughters and he'll make them serve you and he'll tax you and he'll do this and he'll do that. But still, these people wanted to be like everybody else. And so, they got their king and then the, the sad prophecy of Samuel was, was true. And our Lord consoled Samuel and he said, They have not rejected you. 
they have rejected me. It's a very sweet and sad page of sacred scripture the church reads today. Now, St. Ephraim wrote very beautifully about our blessed Savior's kingship and about his divinity, about the adorable mystery of the Trinity, and about uh, the blessed sacrament, the Immaculate Conception. He was one of the first and one of the most beautiful to, uh, one, and the one who wrote most beautifully about this doctrine of our faith, too. St. Ephraim was born to a pagan priest. So he didn't have too much support from his own family, and his father may actually have thrown him out of the house because he insisted on his Christian faith, which he received, they say, from his mother. In any case, um, he went to Nisibis in Syria, and there the bishop James took him into his household and educated him, and there he was ordained a deacon. At a certain point, he uh, left Nisibis when it was too, uh, too dangerous a place to live because of pagan incursions, and he went to Edessa in Syria, uh, where he lived with other monks in caves outside of the city. And there he fasted and prayed and studied and read the sacred scripture and did all of this wonderful Holy Ghost-inspired writing. But at the same time, the Holy Ghost would inspire him out of temporal or spiritual charity to leave his cave and to come down into the city and to be with the children of men. The great difficulty of that day, a little bit like our own in a sense, would be that the devil, as uh, Booth said once, notably, the devil has all the fine tunes. And so the heretics had tunes or hymn tunes that the people learned because they were so singable and so pleasant to their ear, and that by that means the heretics insinuated false doctrine. So the Holy Ghost inspired our saints not only to write lofty poems, but to come down and to write very popular, simple hymns that the people would love to sing. There is sometimes uh, a little bit of a prejudice against the idea of vernacular hymns, as though that was somehow a bow towards Protestantism, which it isn't at all. It goes way back to St. Uh, Ephraim. He was the first one to introduce music into the churches, and it serves a wonderful, wonderful way to stir up to express and to pass on our holy faith in the most simple terms that are accessible to everyone. Not only that, but he started choirs of nuns, and he had the nuns to sing antiphonally, and they sang very beautifully. And then he also put on um, theatrical productions, and plays, and things of that type, which threw the common man in off the street. And again, the purpose? To teach them the Orthodox Catholic faith and the Blessed Trinity and our Lord's divinity, and, uh, and in the Immaculate Conception of the Mother of God. And in doing these things, he was marvelously successful. And at least from the, any city where he lived, the heretics had to give up and retire in shame and confusion. One time he was inspired by the Holy Ghost also to leave his cave and then to go to see St. Uh, Basil, our friend whom we had uh, just on Sunday. And they, they had a wonderful visit and they encouraged each other. But when Basil saw Ephraim coming and he got an advance word of the visit, he said, Is this Ephraim who walked so well in the way of salvation? And St. Ephraim wouldn't have any of the praise and he said he was a poor sinner and he just needed the prayers of great St. Basil. The last time he left his cave was to organize temporal relief during a famine, to organize food and then also a hospital for the sick. This last effort cost him quite a bit because he was by then already an old man. And then shortly thereafter, he died having left behind a very touching and a very humble testament or last will uh, that we still uh, are privileged to possess today. Let me conclude by reading to you a little bit about the Blessed Sacrament as taught by today's saint. You could call it the spiritual reading for our holy hour at the Mass this evening. Do not believe that what I have just given to you is bread. Receive it, eat it, do not crumble it away. That which I have called my body truly is so. The smallest morsel is sufficient to sanctify millions of souls and suffices to give life to those who receive it. Receive and eat with faith, do not waver, for it is my body, and he who partakes of it with faith partakes of the fire of the Holy Ghost. It seems to him who partakes without faith to be but ordinary bread, 
but to him who with faith partakes of the bread consecrated in my name, if he be pure, it preserves his purity. If a sinner, it obtains his pardon. Let those who reject, despise, or outrage this bread know that of a certainty they do outrage to the Son who has called and has made bread to be his body. Take and eat, and by it partake of the Holy Ghost. For it is truly my body, and he who eats thereof has eternal life. It is the bread of heaven come down from on high to us, the manna which the Israelites ate in the desert, the manna which they gathered, the which they despised, although it fell from heaven, was a figure of that spiritual food you have just received. Take ye all of it and eat. In eating this bread, you eat my body, the true source of the redemption. The words of St. Ephraim. God bless you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen.